Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to the Startup Summit. Um, this is uh, another session that's uh, you know, prepared for founders, um, helping them get an understanding of the venture landscape. Um, and uh, I'm really excited to be here to be able to share this with you guys. Um, as I talk to founders a lot, a lot, and um, I, I I always see that there are a couple of things that tends to be missing, or um, you know, some level of knowledge that needs to be there to be able to help them navigate the space, um, especially in terms of understanding what other types of funding that's available. So this uh, presentation is really uh, put together to be able to help give that exposure um, to founders. So. Uh, I guess, yeah, we're talking about the funding landscape, what type of funding, how and when. Um, let me start by talking about who I am. I am the founding partner of Venn Capital. Um, we are a VC accelerator that is um, on a mission to empower the next generation of emerging fund managers. So we run a venture program that is designed to help uh, MBA students to you know, think about venture capital as a career and start building a pipeline um, for them to break into the industry. Um, so yeah, I see myself as a social entrepreneur. I started this because I wanted to really address the problem of diversity in venture. Um, and I've been doing this for two years now. Um, we've trained over 70 uh, fellows that have gone through our flagship program. Um, I'm also an impact investor. I've worked uh, in the uh, ESG space for a while. I currently still do as a consultant. So, um, so I, I, I think I, that sort of exposure in the mission alignment or sort of mission mind investor is what's uh, really part of my um, my passion. Um, and uh, and I'm always you know doing all I can to support founders as they journey um, because it, it often can be uh, a, a tough experience raising funding. So just being able to be a resource to founders um, uh, in the ecosystem. So yeah, what are we going to talk about today? We're going to talk about, um, you know, venture capital. I think that's always the default place where people think when it comes to seeking funding because you're hopefully thinking about your company as the next big idea, you know, uh, that can be a disruptor in whatever space that you're in. Um, so I'm going to start by talk, just giving a little bit of intro into venture capital, and then we'll move on to talk about all the types of funding that's available to founders, um, and then, you know, look at how to fundraise, um, and then when to fundraise. Um, so hopefully, you know, you'll find this very useful. Uh, as you, you know, journey in, in, in your fundraising. Um, so yeah, you know, after that we'll have Q and A sessions and I'll be happy to take questions from anyone. So what's venture capital? Um, you know, it, 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 venture capital is always the default thinking for a lot of people when it comes to thinking about, you know, venture financing. But the truth is, it's just, uh, one small part, or well, not a small part, but uh, a, a part of the um, you know financial landscape in the private market. So you know, venture capital obviously is where a lot of founders that are building tech companies tend to think about raising funding from because there is that additional value proposition that the investor can help you scale the company and maybe has that operating experience to bring on board and, and support you as you journey. Um, so there is that value add to not just, you know, the need for capital, but sort of the mentorship and the support that comes along. Um, but, but you know, the truth is there's, there's all the types of forms of financing that's available to founders. Um, and I'm going to try to touch on a couple of that. But uh, yeah, so venture finance is just one form of that. Um, which is an investment into a company to get an equity in that company. Um, and, and it just goes in different stages, uh, which we're going to talk about. Um, so yeah, it just uh, I want to make sure that I emphasize that enough that venture capital is not, um, is not always the route for a lot of founders. Um, you know, there's always that typical founder type company that would 
uh, the uh, ideal for venture capitalists. Um, um, but there are all those types of funding that's available also. So what I've done is to think about venture capital because the space is really evolving is to kind of think about how did this industry begin and you know how is how is it changing today so uh there is this term called you know full wave of venture that was coined by um uh, uh jim jim from us svd capital and uh you know he's uh he's been one of my mentors in the space for a while now and he you know has been able to create this level of, uh, you know, sort of exposure into thinking about venture as an industry from the very start. Um, and so I put together this to sort of give you an idea of how the venture industry really started and, uh, and where things are right now. Um, so yeah, the very early phase of venture, you can think of, of it um, in the 1970s, right? Um, with the Koreas and the and the, and the protectings of the world, um, and this at this point, this was really when you know you get family offices um, really coming up and seeking you know more risk capital um, or willing to put out more risk capital uh, into companies. Um, and so, at the time, I think the industry was really a very cottage industry where you see a lot of the power was more on the side of the investor. Uh, and it was really relationship driven. It was really about who do you know? Um, and, and, you know, the VCs were like the, you know, the gods at the time that, you know, you just, you will be so privileged to be able to meet them um, and to be able to get into that network. Um, but, you know, after, after the 2020s, uh, I mean, the 2000s, you know, we have we had the second wave where you know this investors now think about the industry um, with a value proposition of like providing service alongside, um, and that's where you see the Andrew Anderson Hardwoods, you know, the Y Combinators, where there's no service add um, and not just the capital that founders will get. Um, and then the third wave is is the evolution of the micro VC, where there's a smaller uh you know smaller vc funds that were starting up um and uh you know and this also you know with i think there was a lot of vc expansion in terms of um you know there's more growth in the farming office industry and now they're more willing to back um so gp uh eventually um and then the fourth wave is uh is sort of where things are you know post 2020 um, I mean, post 2018, where you now have a more diversification and differentiation um, with more VCs, um, you know, emerging managers or VCs coming in from different stages, um, right? So, you know, with what's happening right now, which is a, a, an area that I'm really interested in, is is a diversity in venture where you now see more black VCs that are coming into the industry because the industry has traditionally been uh, uh, heter 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 you know, has been mostly white male um, and and so now we get more diverse founders coming in I mean diverse fund managers coming in into the industry so uh, and that also you know is changing the the, the, the funding levels um, as well um, so, the, the the industry has really evolved um in the past few decades um and, and so you know i think that's good to kind of bear in mind because the truth is even though today we have crowdfunding um that is disrupting venture as an alternative you know a lot of the process uh of, of you know fundraising uh, you know the way it's done the the instruments used are still typically the same um so i just thought this would be a good exposure into the history of venture capital how we started and just be able to give people on a, a better idea of, of venture capital uh, as a whole um so you know how do vcs invest and and who needs the money um so unlike you know angel investors VCs invest um, VCs have to raise money to invest in startups, right? 
they have to, uh, you know, set up a pool of funds that, you know, probably easier money um, and much larger is, you know, money they raise from LPs. Um, so they are more diligent in the investment process because they see themselves as fiduciaries. Um, so, you know, that's why typically they would invest in in in, the, in in a company that they really really believe can be a game changer or a major winner in the space. So investments they make are typically you know for minority stake in a company, um, and it's always for that billion dollar value. Um, and you know the, I think the general idea usually is that, that those companies will become um, winners in the space and then return their fund eventually. Um, so yeah, typically they back technology companies, um, which again, you know, is part of this conversation around, um, you know, venture is, venture capital is really not for everybody. You know, it's ideal for companies that are, you know, you say for example, you're building the next um, AI uh, sort of company, and 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 you need bank, then you need venture, right? But if you're if you're doing something like a, a, a marketplace that is uh, based on um, ad spend or you know consistency or repeat ad spend, you know you you really don't need to give up equity of your company um, to be able to grow your company, right? So there are other forms of funding now that's available for that. But again, that's how VCs tend to operate. Um, so I, I also wanted to put together three key stages, um, and this is just like a, a, a summary of um, the different uh, stages of financing that's available. So first, you, you get that early uh, exploration stage, um, which is usually pre-seed and seed rounds, um, and, uh, and it's usually sort of investors either doing a convertible note of, say, investing in your company, um, with the hope that they can become um, uh, preferred stock owners in that company eventually. And they use instruments like safe and convertible notes um, to be able to do that. And this funding round is usually uh, typically around, um, you know, if it's a pre-seed round, you're thinking about, you know, some do up to 400K uh, of pre-seed. Um, while others, you know, going for, forward into seed, you know, you can even get up to uh, five million of seed investment. Um, so the again, the, the stages of funding tends to have changed over time. Um, you know, there's this saying that you know, pre-seed or, or seed is the next uh, Series A, uh, which really is true because seed investing in the past. So it, a few decades back, it used to be very a much smaller amount, but today you can get seed round of uh, you know one to two million dollars um, or even more. Um, and 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 then when you go to Series A, you get even much higher amounts as well. Um, so yeah, that's pre pre every stage venture. Um, and I'm going to also try to explain. Uh, what stage you should be at when you're looking at what types of funding, um, you know, across the other types of funding that we're going to talk about, but also within venture, um, you also have to be conscious about the stage you're in when you're thinking about funding for your company. If you're kind of in the, if you're kind of building the type of company that needs venture backing, um, so at, at a, at a pre-seed early stage, you know, you should have at least have uh, uh, an MVP, uh, that minimum viable product that is out in the market. Um, you know, a lot of uh, investors in the pre-seed uh, and seed rounds, which are mostly angels uh, or some VCs, micro VCs, uh, some of them would um, invest in companies without revenue, but there has to be some form of traction um, for the company, you know, it, it, it's not a place where you start thinking of an idea. Well, some do invest in, you know, pre, pre ideation even before the company is formed, but still at very much an ideation stage. Um, but I guess the point I'm trying to make is that, you know, there is this shift now where to even get pre seed investment, there has to be significant passion. 
founders have to show um, for VCs to be able to back them. So that's something to be in mind. Um, and then, you know, once you've done that initial, um, you know, pre-seed round, um, and you've done really well, and you're kind of thinking about moving to the next milestone and, and, make, and, and seeking a Series A funding, then you are looking at, um, you know, looking at uh, a prize round um, with an investor. Um, so I think the difference again in terms of prize or in terms of the, the amount that is raised um, usually is, um, you know, you can get seed rounds of, uh, of uh, I mean, Series A rounds of up to 10 million today. Um, and that usually, was much lesser many years ago. So the funding rounds tend to be growing um, with time. And, and, and uh, you know, after Series A, I think the next stage of funding, you know, you think about Series B, C, um, and there's so much more now. Um, for example, uh, you, you know, there are companies now raising Series, series G, like Stripe, that just raised 600 million um, of Series G. So it, it's again, Companies are, I mean, the industry is really evolving and some companies tend to stay much longer in the private market um, to do the much larger valuation for their company before um, they think of exit um, moving forward. But yeah, so that's the three key stages. Um, so the pre-seed um, at a stage where you are still, um, you know, you haven't, you, in, you haven't eventually found a product market fit, but you're uh, at least you have a, a working MVP, you have a customer base, um, you know, you're trying to figure out, you know, your product market fit. Um, at that stage, you, you know, you're typical for a pre seed investor to be willing to consider and invest. Um, again, they have to see the traction. Um, you know, some would do it without uh, revenue, um, but overall, there has to be some form of traction um, that can compel the investor to be willing to invest. Um, and then Series A, you know, it's a prized round. Um, so, in that, so the company has to be valued uh, for pre-seed. You know, you can actually, you know, I think the good thing about pre-seed or seed investing is that investors don't necessarily have to price the round. Um, and it's good for the founder because that you know they 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 have, they don't have to stick to a certain price of the equity in the company. Um, so they can do value for the company um, and then get to a point where if they transition to the next round of funding, then you know that whatever funding based on the note and now be converted into equity based on the new price uh, of the round. Um, so that's a good thing about that pre-seed. And then Series A is, you know, you're, you're already proving a lot more in terms of the product and the market. Um, and you need that capital to be able to um, get to product market fit. Um, so, you know, Series A would always be the typical way to go about, you know, scaling to that point. And then post-Series A is growth, really. Um, getting going beyond pro market fit to um you know go to market fit like you know how do you grow the company really how do you do the sales and the marketing how do you uh have a playbook of sales that can be repeatable um and and so at that point you know you already proven to investors that you know you you there is a product market fit but 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 still there is a need for growth for the company. Um, so yeah, that's just a, a brief on, on, on the types of the stages of venture or just venture capital as a whole. Um, but my focus really, because uh, when I see founders a lot, um, I, I realize that a lot of them are seeking the wrong kind of financing for their company. So what I've done is to really help think about alternative forms of financing that's available today that can help you build your company to a point where if you then decide to go to venture uh, or VCs, you, you have a higher valuation for your company and you have a stronger bargaining power um, when, you, you know, when you're negotiating with them. So what are these other types of funding? 
Um, so um, again, what I've done here is to kind of provide different stages um, and then different funding that you should be thinking about. So if you are proving your your problem as a founder, you're typically at that very ideation stage. So you are you know, either going to do this with your personal savings um, because it's not it's not expensive today to build a, a mean viable product, right? Because there's a lot of tools today that are available. Um, and when you do that, you reserve equity in your company. And you, you know, you're not selling it out very early. Um, so you can really build the product out to the way you want. Um, so, you know, you, you use personal savings to do that. You can, you know, get funding from family and friends. Um, and again, this is where grant com, com, comes in. Um, so you can get grants to help you um, to build your product. Um, so, you know, to again, test out your, the problem that you're trying to solve as a founder. Uh, how, how great are you in solving that problem? How, you know, how personal is it to you as well? Um, and, and so those are, I think the, the kind of thing that you should be thinking about when you are at that typical place where as a founder, you're trying to, you know, prove that you can solve a problem. Um, and then the next stage of that is the, you know, problem market, uh, pro problem product fit, where you are um, trying to determine that there is uh, a, 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 you know, the product that you're building can actually solve that problem, right? So the, the first stage, you are proving that you as a founder can solve a problem, right? So it, it, there's a there's a little bit difference there. Um, so you know at that very stage, uh, at the second stage, you're kind of trying to prove that whatever product that you're building can solve that problem. So at this stage, grants, angel investors, incubators, loans, crowdfunding, um, pre-seed venture again is a uh, sources of funding that can be considered. Um, and then the third stage is for product market fit, which is um, where, again, you've proven that there is a problem and that your product can solve the problem. Um, but again, you have to go beyond the product to the market to kind of prove that there is a fit for whatever market that you're trying to address. Um, because remember, if you're, again, this can apply to other types of funding, um, but if it is VC, you're really typically trying to tell the investor that you are addressing a billion dollar market, you know, and you can capture a share of that market. Um, and this is you're telling them this is typically a billion dollar opportunity. Um, so you have to really prove that there is a, a fit for the product uh, between the product and the market. Um, so that's the third stage. Um, and th at this stage, you know, there's typical VC funding, pre-seed and seed funding from VC. Um, the other typical funding is um, people join accelerator programs. Um, and, and I would, you know, again, strongly encourage people to do that because a lot of times, you know, there is so much learning that, that can be done in that process. Um, so, you know, accelerators are always there to help you navigate uh, the, the, the market and the product. Um, and they have, you know, mentors and, and industry experts that are already, you know, have done this before that can mentor you through that process. Um, so incubators are a really great place. And a lot of them would give you equity and they would give you capital in exchange for a small equity in the company. Um, so yeah, incubators, angels, typical for uh, the third stage of financing. Um, and then moving on from the stage, you know, if you've been able to prove all these things that we've talked about, you're now thinking about validating the market, uh, the go-to-market, which is really the growth stage uh, of the company. Um, that's where Series A comes in, Series E, C, um, and fourth is really the scaling um you know getting into new markets um and that's where we see you know the large the really large rounds from um, some of these companies that we, we love and use their products every day because they've really proven the 
uh, proven that they can be a found, you know, as a founder, they can solve the problem. They've proven that, you know, the product can solve the problem. They've proven that, you know, that there's a fit with the product on the market. Um, and, you know, they've also proven that, you know, they can sell and, and, and they've really scaled um, and they've been able to uh, get into the market. So at the fifth stage, they are really trying to uh, get additional capital just to continue to grow and extend into new markets. Um, you know, and maybe some of them delay, you know, exit because they want to grow the value of the company even more. Um, and then the final stage is, is you know, reaching exit. Um, so I, I am hoping that this would help guide founders because a lot of times, you know, I, I when I look and I listen to people talk about funding, you know, there's less conversation about the stage where you are as a founder when you're seeking this funding. Because if you understand the stage you are and the funding that's available for that stage, you will be in a much better position to navigate your fundraising um, and also, uh, you know, save equity in your company and, 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 um, growth as you want because a lot of times you're looking for capital um, and you know and there could be other ways to get it without dilution without giving up equity in your company so um, so yeah this is uh, just like a, a, a breakdown of the different stages this is what I usually use with founders when they approach me um, again typically they would come you know seeking venture funding um, and a lot of the time, you know, probably 90% of the time, they are not ready for venture funding. Um, so I always use this as sort of guidance to say, you have to, be, you have to kind of look back and, and, and ask yourself, where are you as a founder or as a company? Um, are, you, are you just trying to build an idea? You, I mean, are you just trying to build a product based on this idea you have about solve the problem is that where you are if you don't have a product yet um and you're already pitching to angel investors and vcs um it, you know you're really wasting the time right because what you really need is to find a way to build that product um and you know if you don't have personal savings that like you can use to do that then you know ask friends to kind of you know help or fake grants that can help you, which is equity free money, right? That can help you build that product. And I would not encourage loans because, you know, you are most likely going to eventually find out that the product that you think would change the world is really not going to change the world or it's, it's not going to be something people are crazy about, right? So, you know, a lot of times you're excited about it, um, but, you know, the market is going to hit you and you realize that, oh, okay. This is just personal obsession, or just you know. So there's a lot of learning that happens. So you cannot afford to take loans to to do that learning because you're going to have to pay them back, right? Um, so so you know you have to kind of ask yourself that question: Is that the stage that I'm, that I'm in right now as a founder? Um, you know, don't send VCs your pitch deck of ideas that you you think are really going to be great. Um, maybe you have created a website, you know, but you don't actually have a product, uh, whatever it is, or a service, or, you know, and you didn't have customers, um, you know. So at that stage, you, you're still very much stage one. So you shouldn't be thinking of VCs or even angels at that, right? You should be thinking of how am I going to find, you know, how am I going to, you know, even bootstrap and just like, Build that initial idea because if you're really committed and you believe in that idea, then you sh it should cost something. You should be willing to pay uh, something out of your pocket to you create it. Um, and then um, once you prove it, you know you can now move to the next stage. You, you can start talking to investors, um, you know whatever investors they are, you know and and, and and then you have something to show. Um, so so yeah, I just I, I don't know. I'm, I'm emphasizing this over and over because I I see founders make this mistake over and over. Um, and a lot of times they give up on 
idea because we cannot raise the funding for it. And, 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 and who knows, that could be a great idea that could potentially be the next disruptor. Um, so, so, you know, it, I think when funding is not available, it's not always a question of the, the idea not being a, a great idea or suitable idea. It's always about, you know, what kind of funding are you seeking at that point, right? That can help you achieve those milestones that is the next level. Um, so, so yeah, that's, again, that's for that initial, if that's where you are, you just have the idea, you haven't built a product, please consider personal savings, family, friend grants. Um, but if you've, if you've gone beyond that and you have a product and now through your product, you have customers, right? And you know, through that, whether it's a product or a service, you have customers, it could be on a, in a beta stage, right? You're still testing it out. Uh, but you have actual customers, uh, people that are using it and, and they are testing it for you. Um, and from them, you can get feedback and kind of understand if, you know, the, the value that you're proposing is, is what it is and if it appeals to the consumer or uh, the customer, whether it's B2B or B2C products or market that you're addressing. Um, so, so that's that, you know, that second phase kind of, if that's where you are, you should use grants. You know, you can use angels, you can use incubators, you know, join an incubator. If they can help you think through that product and problem and make sure there is a match. Um, in crowdfunding, we're, we're gonna talk about uh, some of that um, uh, um, um, subsequently. But yeah, crowdfunding VC pre-seed um, is also an option. Um, so yeah, I think I'm emphasizing those early stages of proving that you as a founder can solve a problem or, you know, you know, proving that the product can solve that problem um, and, and also achieving product market fit. Um, those three stages is really very early. Um, so it's good to be able to know the kind of funding that's available to you at that point so that you can get that funding and really move on and build that product and, 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 and grow the company um, to whatever point um, you want it to get to before you start talking to VCs and, and diluting or giving up equity in your company. All right, um, so, you know, what other kinds of funding available? Grants, um, so grants is equity-free money, right? That allows you to build or even reveal uh, as we are currently in this climate of COVID. Um, so there is a lot of rebuilding that founders have to do. Um, and there's a lot of grants, you know, within the country that you live in, there is grants to support small businesses, grants to support startups um, in this very difficult times. Um, so I would leverage that if you're still at that very early stage um, to get funding that keeps the equity with you. Um, and, 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 you know, typically grant funding, again, is by the Asian stage when you're trying to establish uh, the team and, and prove that you can solve a problem. So grants can also be for stage two, which is where you already have a team, maybe a small team, and you're trying to prove you have customers, uh, which we term the adopters, and you can, you're can trying to prove to them that you can solve the problem. So if you're at that stage, definitely is what's seeking grants. Um, again, there is a lot of website now that provide grants, uh, um, uh, that provide a uh, list of grants that's available. So if you Google grants, um, you would come up with a lot of resources that's available today for grant funding. Um, so the next is, you know, crowdfunding. And this, you know, is open. I think I would encourage H2 founders, um, you know, just pass ideation. You know, you have a product, you have customers. Um, you know, they don't necessarily have to be paying customers, but if you are at that stage, um, you know, you can use crowdfunding. Um, and I think crowdfunding is really changing the landscape of an alternative source of funding, especially with the COVID, 
uh, situation right now across the world. Uh, I think crowdfunding has really, uh, you know, escalated so much that, uh, you know, people are using it as an alternative now. Um, so, you know, even, I think even at ideation stage today, you can, you know, use crowdfunding to actually prove, I think some people call it failing fast. You can use it to actually test out the, the, the idea in terms of like proving that you, uh, I mean, that the product can solve that problem, right? So, um, you know, if you think about how crowdfunding works, you know, typically you, you as a founder, you raise a small amount from a large group of people, which are typically on accredited investors, um, to fund the project, a project or your venture. Um, so at this point, you can really, I think, the value. A lot of people would say, don't use crowdfunding if all that you're looking for is capital, which makes sense because the value of crowdfunding is really, um, you know, proving out. That, that product or proving out that there is value in what you're offering because if at the end of the day you're able to get the crowd to invest, to become your advocates, they become your customers, um, even though they are your backers, right? So they become the people that will tell their friends about the product. Um, but to be able to achieve that, you you know, that product has to be able to appeal to the customer. So crowdfunding is, is really the place where you can achieve, you know, multiple things at the same time. So it becomes your marketing platform. It, it becomes your fundraising platform. Um, so, you know, I, I think it's, it's it's another source of funding that's available today that I have seen a lot of founders use. Um, and, you know, interestingly, VCs are also open to it now in the sense that if you raise crowdfunding and you're moving on to do series, you know, seed or series A fundraising, um, you know, the, usually there's that, I, you know, worry about your cap table, uh, but, but with crowdfunding now, there's a lot of, uh, you know, um, data that becomes available to the investor to be able to see your action. Um, and so it makes due diligence so much easier for them. Um, so, so yeah, I would recommend crowdfunding, um, if you are at stage two, um, in some occasions, stage one also, um, but typically it's stage two that is trying to prove that I have a product that, um, you know, can solve this problem. It doesn't have to be the entire suit of product, right? So that's why it's called an MVP, that's minimum viable product. That initial, you know, uh, you know, components of the idea that will solve that problem, right? So you don't have to build the entire product at once. You can start with that initial uh, tangible product that you think will solve that problem. And then you can do on for it if you determine that the product is actually resonating with people's problems and it can address that problem um, significantly. Um, so funding in you know, the funding model it ranges from revenue share, um, you know, this republic uh, in the U.S. that allows you to, uh, you know, you as a founder to put out your campaign and get investors invest as little as hundred dollars into the the campaign, um, and they become, you know, sort of investors, and it's like a debt financing because they end up uh, getting to share your revenue. Um, until you're able to pay back uh, whatever that amount is that you've borrowed, right? So there is that revenue share model. There is reward-based Kickstarter. Um, I'm sure a lot of people know about it. Um, so, you know, you could start, if you don't want to uh, share your revenue, you, you could start with a uh, reward base that you can tell, you can do, you know, there's a reward for somebody that invests in that company or invests in that product. Um, so there is also equity crowdfunding, for example, that engine, um, even today, there's founders raising Series A on that engine, um, you know, um, so, so I think the crowdfunding space is really, really, uh, it has evolved in the COVID situation and all that's changing today or that have changed today, I 
a lot of founders are finding that as a great resource. Um, there is also alternative uh, alternatives that offer capital as a service. Um, so when you think of lighter capital, uh, Claire Bank, Uvine, they are also uh, not the typical crowdfunding, but they provide sort of funding on a revenue share basis, right? So again, if you're thinking about building a product and it's not really a typical uh, technology product, right? You don't have to um, <clears throat> start thinking about venture capital because you're know, giving up equity and a lot of that funding actually goes at spend. Um, so some of this alternative is there now to help you cut on, you know, pay for your ad spend on, on, on a debt basis, right? So you're not giving up equity, but you're just borrowing money um, or sharing your revenue um, as a form of uh, financing um, to be able to get those ads and cover. Um, so those are other alternatives within this crowdfunding space that I have seen emerge that's also available today that founders can explore. Um, typically, stage two founders, I would recommend. Um, and then, you know, again, if you, if you, if you have an MVP, you have, uh, you have customers, then this is where you can test that out. Um, through crowdfunding, um, but you, you, I've seen crowdfunding that's for projects too, that is just the idea is still uh, being built, so it's not really completed, it's just still very much an idea, uh, and they use crowdfunding to fundraise for that. Um, so, you know, it's not always about venture capital. You could do crowdfunding, it's also an alternative. And then there are small businesses which, you know, evolve interest rates um, and there are terms, fixed terms involved. Um, so again, stage two, typically I would not encourage a founder to seek a loan, small business loan or microfinance loan to view the product um, because that product uh, or that idea can end up failing, right? So what happens then you have, you have credits that would have to be paid with interest. Um, so typically, you know, it, it depends on the, if it is a brick and mortar business, you know, and you can show, obviously, you can get a, a loan, there's guarantees, there's all the things that have to be shown, which is the benefit of equity funding, where you don't necessarily have to show all of that. So loans are more conservative in terms of risk. Um, and so it, 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 there's going to be a lot more that you have to show to be able to get a, business, a, a small business loan, but it's, it's also an option for a new startup. And then, you know, there's angel capital, um, you know, and these are, you know, wealthy individuals that like to invest their own personal money into companies. Um, uh, and, and there's a growing network of them now. Uh, there's a lot of angel networks that you know you can explore and reach out to again this is if you're typically a technology company um, that can show that potential uh, value that we talked about and you know it's what we bring um, and, and angels prefer to be in that very early stage of financing so pre-seed and seed uh, is the typical time that angels like to invest in companies and then there's venture debt, which is another type of financing that uh, you know came that has uh, become popular in the recent years. Um, and, and you know it's sort of a, a nice way to get more capital without giving up a lot of equity. Um, and it's a little bit different from the other types of financing that we've talked about. Venture debt usually typically would be for companies that have raised equity rounds. Um, and so, you know, for the investors that have participated in those rounds, it's beneficial for them if there is not too much dilution. So when you do a venture debt, essentially you can get much more capital, maybe 20 to 30% more capital with less equity being given out, um, which helps investors on your cap table because they you know, they don't want to see more dilution. So if there's a way you can get more capital with less dilution, 
um, or giving up less number of FD, then that's also a good alternative. Um, so typical venture debts, you know, could be for working capital, you know, bridge financing or insurance policy. We, you know, currently in this climate of COVID. So a typical example of venture debt is, you know, a Series A company that, you know, gets to raise a million in venture round Series A, right? And then they give up 25% equity in that company. Um, you know, they can typically get a venture debt of three million to add to that. Um, and that brings them to 30 million um, round, right? Um, and they've just given up 0.25% of that company, right? So, you know, at the end of the day, they've raised 30 million at 25.25%. Uh, so that's a really good way to sort of get more uh, capital infused or get more capital for whatever round of fundraising you are in. Uh, but again, the venture debt is typical for companies that have raised equity um, and now seeking to sort of get an additional debt um, on that. And this also tends to be the case with series, you know, G, E, F, right? For example, Airbnb did a recent um, um, round um, before they went public um, this year. Um, so it's again, it's another another great way. I mean, last year, it's another great way to uh, get more capital um, and be, you know with very little uh, equity involved. All right, so that brings us to how to fundraise, right? So I haven't talked touched on the technicalities of this different types of fundraising just that's really a topic for another time because there is you know there's so much to cover in that um and i think the, the purpose of this of this session is really to give you an idea of the landscape that's not really to kind of walk you through how to, you know um uh, the different types of funding but again yeah to walk you through the type of funding but it's not really you know it, it's very little, it's so much that we can cover. So I'm trying to focus on kind of giving you an overview and then um, talking more about the process itself of Andre. Um, so that's what we're gonna be talking about now. Um, a very good friend of mine, Nick Beckard, who is uh, one of the um, well-known uh, growth, you know, fundraising hacks, you know, in Silicon Valley and, you know, he, he he, he said it right, you know, that fundraising is a numbers game. You have to be willing to do so much of conversation um, to be able to get to that round of, of be able to raise the money that you want to raise. So, you know, it's something that you have to walk on diligently. Um, and, and again, it, it has to be, you have to put a lot of numbers into it. And numbers, not necessarily the amount of fundraising, but numbers in terms of how many people you have to talk um, to be able to get there. So this is again what people do wrong um, when it comes to fundraising. Um, I get this emails a lot, or you know, LinkedIn uh, messages a lot, right? I'm the type of person that if you send me a LinkedIn request, I would accept. Um, the, irrespective of whatever I would accept. Um, so at the end of the day, well, I always know that after that, after that like, uh, request comes the message, right? So, and I would always get this message, you know, typically from founders in introductions to investors, right? So, you know, if you don't know what you want, how can I help you? I think that's the nice way to put it, right? So, you know, asking, for angel investors is just too broad. You have to be more specific um, about it. So that's, again, what I'm trying to do here to help you to be more specific in terms of how you fundraise. So think about fundraising as a sales process. You know, so you have to generate the, the lead, you have to qualify the lead, you engage, and then you close. Um, this is really how you get your fundraising done. 
you know, you can't depend on sending messages here and there and hoping that there will be, you know, responses. Um, and, and typically, I will tell you how this industry works. You know, you can't really help somebody you don't know. You know, you've got to know somebody before you can. For example, I have a lot of investors in my network, right? And I always get requests from founders that want that introduction, right? So I want to preserve my network and I know my investors, what they want, or the kind of founders they back, right? So if you send me a request, I, I typically want to be able to understand what you're doing, you know? Um, build that initial conversation and relationship, understand where you are, um, and then determine if you're a fit based on the investment pre preference of, of investors in my network, I can better guide you um, in that process. So, you know, think about this as a process of, you know, generating leads, numbers of investors you get to qualify them and determine if they are good, you know, they fit whatever uh, company they invest in, the company you invest in, if there's a, a fit there. Um, and then you can start engaging with them. And hopefully, if you do it right, you'll be able to close. Um, so, yes, it is a sales process. But what are you selling, right? So, you're selling the team. That's, I think, a priority for a lot of investors. They want to invest in a team that can execute, a team that has the grit and tenacity, you know, a team that has the passion. Um, in, in a lot of cases, a team that have that exceptional founder that can tell their story accurately or can tell the story com compellingly, right? That have experienced that problem before. Um, you know, and, and I can tell you, you see, it's time to have this way they qualify founders, right? They, they know founders that are change makers. Uh, um, you know, they, 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 they look at founders in different ways. The founders they consider as dynamos, like exceptional, brilliant, smart. So you, you have to um, think about your team. Obviously, you yourself, right? If you're trying to solve a problem, what qualifies you to be the person to solve this problem? Have you experienced this before? Do you have the technical ability to build the product? Um, so it doesn't, it doesn't just, it's, I guess it's not just about the idea. It's also about who is selling the idea and who is executing on the idea. So I think when you're selling to investors or selling to them, again, as we talked about, about this process of fundraising as a sales process. You're trying to get them to engage with you, so you're selling to them. So you have to uh, sell the team. You you know, if it's just you, um, maybe it might be wise to think about getting more people into the team so that there is a team of people that have the, the ability, the passion, the grit, the ability to execute on that product. So, so that when they see um, your team, you know, they can say, yes, I, I can bet on this guy. You know, the idea could evolve tomorrow. It could probably would end up being something else. But if there is a team that can execute, a team that have the right, you know, ability to compel people and, and tell the story, um, and then that team will always, uh, you know, know how to navigate the market, right? So. I think that's important for a lot of investors when they're investing in a company, they want to know um, who, who, is, who is doing this, you know, um, and how, you know, what's the story behind it. Um, so that's, that's one, two, you're, you're selling the product, the value. Um, you know, there is this uh, conversation that's going on now about thinking about your product or consumer journey, you know, the plot of the product as, you know, conflict, think about it as, you know, as we all like to watch movies and we, we don't like spending time watching crappy movies, right? So when we see movies that are really great, you know, we love to experience it, you know, and, and a lot of times, you know, it, I mean, not a lot of times, every movie has a plot, right? So the, the writer of that movie, you know, they, they have to consciously think about how to create these different scenarios that make sense, that you can relate with, 
um, and take you through that journey um, of seeing that conflict. Um, getting to a point where there is a development, right? Uh, you know, and, and you think the problem is, is being solved and then boom, there is another, uh, you know, another major uh, conflict that arises. Um, and, and then it just goes on until there is that final moment of um, fulfillment, that resolution that happens, right? That I feel like, wow, this is it, you know, this, this 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 has been solved, right? This has brought that joy and appeal that you know make you feel like this person is a hero, right? Um, so I think it's it's wise to also think about a company in that sense that you know what is the problem? You know that's the conflict. What's the problem that is being solved here? Um, you know who is the customer? Right. I think a lot of them found speech to us and we just realized that they have a great product. In fact, they understand the market, um, you know, and so many other things seems right. But they don't really, the product is just so many things, right? It's not, you can, you can point on that one thing that the product does. You know, in that sense, they don't know who the customer is. They, you know, they haven't identified the customer. And if, if, you, if the company is at that stage, you know, there's a lot of things that can go wrong. So it's, it's important to sort of go through that process of identifying who the, 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 the customer is, right? You know, for example, you, you know, DoorDash, for example, you think about a product like that. You, you have to think about that problem of, maybe a working mom that has to come home and, and, and take care of kids and, you know, have a lot that is going on around her um, and probably doesn't have time when it comes to that big question of what, what are we going to have for Dina? So, you know, there has to be something that she's thinking about or something that can help her overcome that, right? Um, and that thing can become somebody that can help deliver, you know, maybe an app that allows her to order food online. She doesn't have to worry about cooking dinner, and that food can come easy as, you know, being somebody deliver, deliver it on her doorstep. You know, so you, you can build a product that is like an app that helps people find restaurants. That's great. You know, it solves a major problem. But does it take them through? Because there's so many other hurdles that customer have to go through, you know, between the product and the problem being solved, right? So if you think through the product much more, you get to a point where there is a much larger uh, you know, fulfillment that comes when that customer uses the product, which, for example, in the case of DoorDash, is that ability for somebody else to come right at the door and bring the food. So it's that food that that consumer has. Um, so that's one example of, you know, the value of a product. So, you know, you're selling that, so you have to be able to think through that, you know, think through the plot of the product, the consumer, the journey they have to go through to find that satisfaction and ultimately, uh, ultimately get, you know, feel that that problem is solved for them. Um, and, and again, you know, this would apply in different ways with different founders with different product services, but the idea is the same. You know, it's it's about a problem and, and a solution, right? So there is a journey between the, from that product to the, to, to, I mean, from, from the problem solving to the solution. Um, so thinking through that will help you develop a really good product. And, and when you're teaching to investors, you have to be able to tell the story effectively. Um, and then the other thing is traction, right? So in economics, you know, it has to be a valid business model. Um, so again, I'm talking about investors, venture capital investors, right? So if you're doing crowdfunding, well, you know, they help you build all this out. There's a really good thing about crowdfunding. You, you know, if you have a great product and idea, maybe you have a few customers, you know, they can help you 
think this through and you know further uh, build out the business model. Um, well, they don't necessarily build it for you, but there's a lot of other support that is being provided. Um, so I'm not talking about using crowdfunding now. I'm talking when I talk about unit economics and, and the value business model. I'm talking about you know when you're thinking of venture capital specifically, um, you know you have to show these things um, to be able to sell to the investor effectively. Um, and then the market opportunity, you know, obviously billion dollar has to be a large market. Um, and then, you know, the terms of the investment or the ask that you have has to also be quite favorable to the investor. So those are what you're selling when you're, you know, thinking about fundraising, you know, it's a sales profit. This is what you're selling. Um, but it doesn't just end there, right? So you have to generate, you know, this is like a 50 state view of my friend Nathan, you know, you have to kind of look at this. This is really the process to getting to the very end of it. So, from you know, the job is to get investors from the top funnel and get them to the very end of it where you get that uh, agreement executed. Um, so, you have to generate that initial broad database of investors, bring them, you know, you select appropriate contact persons. Um, filter the matches, um, initiate the conversation, and then do follow-on due diligence. And you know, before you eventually get to the end of it. So that's really process of fundraising, right? Um, but let's let's go a little bit deeper. Um, so say you're building your funnel. Again, it's a numbers game. I can't emphasize that enough. So you have to aim for a large number of investors, do a lot of pitches, get typically a small amount of, you know, commitments. Um, so, you know, this is something to be in mind so that when you're starting off at the very top of the funnel, you have to have a large pool. Um, and then walking your way down that pool, you realize that all that will go down. Um, so this again, step by step, you can start building your investor funnel with LinkedIn, uh, you know, with AngelList, Crunchbase, you can get organized with the CRM, you can start having the conversation in a hustle like you've not done before. Um, so how do you find, or what do you fundraise? Uh, I think by now, I hope that people will be able to understand or be able to answer that question. Um, which is when you need capital to grow. And I've shown earlier on the different stages and what kind of funding is typical. Um, so yeah, I got this resource that I hope will be helpful. If somebody's thinking about using Nathan's platform, I have uh, recommended it for a lot of founders, but our fundraising is a great platform that allows you to sort of build that investor funnel. Um, you know, so instead of creating a, a, a spreadsheet, uh, as your CRM, you can use a platform like Founder Search, and if you use Venture Capital, uh, you know this deal discount code, you can get a discount from them. Um, and that's it. Feel free to ask me questions, um, and I'll be happy to take them.